Today is the first Sunday of Advent in which we recall the hope that we have in Christ. God told Abraham that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed because he trusted and he put his hope in God. I will make you a great nation, God told Abraham. I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. The Old Testament spoke of the coming Christ, of how a savior would be born, a king in the line of David. He would rule the world wisely and bless all the nations. We too believe in God's promise to bless all people through Jesus. And we believe Jesus will come again to this world to bring light into the darkness and to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Hope is like lighting, as a, like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we, we celebrate the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Almighty, all-loving God, your love is revealed to us in Jesus Christ, Son of God and the Son of David. Help us in preparing to celebrate his birth, to make our hearts ready, and to place our hope in you. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your hope with others. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. I invite you now to listen to the messages on hope from Pastor George and Pastor Donovan. Good day, folks. Uh, Pastor George from the Chetwin Gospel Tabernacle. And uh, it's a real pleasure to greet you and meet you uh, during the Advent season leading up to Christmas. It's a great time of the year to celebrate, and I just pray that as we share together in these devotions, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to be celebrating. And so in the next little while, I'm going to be sharing two messages, and you'll notice in my second message, I'm going to be wearing the same tie and shirt because I'm doing both of these productions uh, on the same day. And so I want to read to you today from God's Word, uh, from Matthew chapter 1. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes like this. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in his mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. Amen. In the next couple of messages, I want to talk about hope, and I want to talk about peace. Question, what is the best message for Christmas? Is it Merry Christmas? Wishing you a Christmas that's merry and bright? We hope you have a safe and relaxing holiday season or Merry Christmas with lots of love. I hope your Christmas is filled with joy this year or simply thank God for Christmas, enjoy the season. What message does our culture, our society, or even our religious community expect, expect to hear this Christmas? Let me ask another question, first of all, before I answer the first one. Is Christmas just about prophets? Is it just about decorations? 
gift giving and gift receiving? Is it about just trees and wrappings and lightings, uh, turkey dinners and family gatherings? The two messages that I would like to share today about the Advent season are messages of hope and messages of, of peace. I want us to look beyond the tangible and look within our own hearts today. And let me ask you the question, are we people of hope and are we people of peace? Talking about God's plan for the Gentile world, and that would include you and me today, the Apostle Paul made this statement, and this is the secret that Christ in your hearts is your only hope of glory. Note that word. And yet it is sometimes difficult uh, to describe hope in language that is easily understood. Some people refer to hope as this, a feeling of expectation and a desire for certain things to happen. It has been said that hope is staying positive in the midst of hardship. Maybe some folk listening today, you hope for the healing of a loved one. You hope for a job promotion, a meaningful relationship. And maybe you hope to break some distasteful habits. Maybe you hope for a new house, a car a vacation that you've been looking forward to for a long, long time. It is so natural for us as humankind to hope, to expect, and to have a desire for certain things. The Old Testament prophets had an expectation and a deep burning desire for the coming of the Messiah. They had hope for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the prophet Isaiah who said, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the coming of Christ is hope fulfilled and hope assured. Jesus is the embodiment of hope. Jesus is hope in the flesh, hope in a living being, hope in the very Son of God. And you and I know that Christmas can be about so many things that it has absolutely nothing to do with Christmas. Why, even the church sometimes has difficulty in understanding that the foundation of hope is found in the Messiah, in the person of Jesus Christ, whose purpose in coming was to save his people from their sin and give them hope. And when we accept Christ as our personal Savior, and when we internalize the broadest dimensions of who he is, then we can shout with Paul in his message to the church at Colossae that Christ in your heart is your only hope of glory. When we have faith in Christ, we have hope for things eternal, things that will never decay, or waste, or waste away. Having hope in Christ, it's, it's not a form of escapism. Hope in Christ is not just some wishful thinking. In our churches today, we still sing the old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. 
on Christ, the solid rock I stand, and all of the ground is sinking sand. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope in Jesus is solidified when we measure it against the background of His birth, His death on the cross, and certainly against the background of the empty tomb. It's all about our hope in a person. And because the good news about Jesus Christ is a universal gospel, then the hope that Jesus brings is a universal hope. We're going through difficult times, maybe in our own personal lives, in our family, our local communities and churches, on a national and international level, life today is tough. And people are looking for hope, something that they can hold on to. And during the Christmas season, as we look forward to the birthing of the Lord Jesus Christ, He brings hope. And you and I today can rejoice in the hope that He brings. In speaking of Jesus, Matthew quoted the prophet Isaiah, In His name, nations will put their hope. In His name, nations will put their hope. And, and quoting Isaiah, the, the Apostle Paul said, The Gentiles will hope in Him. Today we hope in Jesus. Today we hope in the Messiah. Today we hope in the Savior. We hope in the resurrected Christ. In writing to young Timothy, the Apostle Paul said in his introduction, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Jesus Christ our hope. Amen. Maybe the greatest hope of the born again is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, in writing to Titus, Paul encourages us to live upright and godly lives. He said, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, how wonderful it is to have hope in Christ even while we live today. But our hope extends beyond the temporal, the physical, the fleeting things of life. Our hope extends itself into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Thank God for the hope we have today, for the hope we have tomorrow, and for the hope we have that one day we will meet with God in heaven. Amen. I want you to have a joyous Christmas, have a great time, celebrate with excitement and an enthusiasm, and may that hope be born in your life today and in the days to come. God's blessing from us to you on this blessed day. Amen. As kids, my sister and I had a wonderful book, uh, an old book full of missionary stories, ranging from the Apostle Paul all the way to the uh, 1980s, uh, from Ireland to the Holy Land. Uh, it was full of stories of people learning of Jesus for the first time, and thus it was entitled, I Heard Good News Today. Uh, and I'd like to share with you today, if, if you don't mind, a story from that book entitled, The Tree That Points to Heaven. So it was Christmas Eve in the year 724. The moon was shining brightly through the snow-covered trees, and the branches looked like a million diamonds all around. Through the deep white snow walked a group of men, single file. Their leader, a man called Boniface, walked first. Uh, these men had come to Germany as missionaries. Now, trudging through the snow was hard work, and one man asked if it wasn't maybe time to make camp for the night. No, said Boniface, we have important work to do tonight. 
It is Yuletide, and the people of the forest are gathered at the great oak tree to worship their god Thor. I believe they'll make a sacrifice, and we must get there to break the evil power their god has over them. With this news, the little group of men hurried on through the snow until finally they could see the bright red glow in the distance through the forest. As they crept closer, they soon realized that it was a fire that had been started in front of a huge oak tree. The men saw a large group of people gathered in a half circle around the fire, all dressed in pure white, as if they were waiting for something special to happen. Boniface and his men crept closer. In front of the people, a priest was standing in his long robe. He lifted his arms and he began to chant, This is the night when the sun dies. This is the hour of darkness. Thor, god of thunder and war who dwells in this oak tree, has shown us that he's angry with us. Our crops have failed. The wolves have devoured our sheep. Our enemies have defeated us in battle. We must once again feed the roots of Thor's holy tree with blood. A murmur of approval rippled through the crowd. The priest lifted his face and cried out, Thor demands that you give him the best and the dearest that you have. As he walked over to the place where the kids were standing to watch the fire, a chill began to run through the crowd, and it quickly became silent. This is the chosen one, said the priest. He alone can take away your sin. He laid his hands on the head of little Asolf, the son of the village chief. Asolf was loved by the people. He had an especially infectious laugh. Asolf's parents were frozen with horror and an audible sigh passed through the entire crowd as the priest led little Prince Asolf to a big stone in front of the fire. Boniface, meanwhile, was standing behind some trees, quietly watching events unfold, waiting for the perfect moment. Noiselessly, he moved closer. As the priest asked the boy to kneel on the stone, and he raised high the hammer of Thor, Boniface leapt out from his hiding place, grabbed the hammer from behind. No, shouted Boniface, no, this sacrifice is not necessary. The God of heaven and earth is not angry with you. He loves you and he sent his own son to die for you. As one, the entire crowd leapt to their feet. Some were angry that Boniface interrupted their sacred ritual and demanded that he be killed. Others from the crowd were filled with joy and gratitude that their little prince was safe. Out from the crowd walked their chieftain, Asolf's father. He raised his hand. He stopped the noise. What word do you have for us from the God of whom you speak? He asked Boniface. Well, Boniface stepped forward. The word is love, he replied. Jesus, God's son, was born this night to be savior of the whole world. The power of evil is broken. Thor has no power. Boniface pointed to the big oak tree. You say this is Thor's tree, he said. See if he'll protect it. He motioned to his helpers, and quickly from the shadows they came toward the tree with their axes, and they began the work of chopping it down. The people were frightened. The priests muttered angrily. Surely the mighty god Thor would strike these men dead for cutting down his tree. But nothing happened. All was quiet in the forest, save for the chop, chop, chopping of the axes against the tree. Finally, that old oak came crashing down to the forest floor. Your God is dead, cried Boniface. The true God bids you worship him and him alone. He walked over to a little fir tree standing nearby. Let this little tree, which always remains green and points to heaven, remind you of the life that Jesus has brought, he said. Boniface cut down the little tree and he carried it to the chieftain's hall. Little Asolf and his parents, as well as the other people, gathered there together and rejoiced for the good news that Boniface had brought them about God. The time came, and is upon us now, when around Germany, and indeed around the world, people around the globe gather together in their homes around a little green tree at Christmas time to celebrate the birth of the Christ child and God's everlasting love. I told this story to some of the kids at Peace Christian School a few years back, and when we came to the part where Boniface explained the symbolism of the fir tree, I asked the kids what they thought it meant, that the tree almost always stays green. One little girl explained it beautifully. The tree is always green, she said, because Jesus always loves us. That's beautiful. 
Uh, the next time you see a Christmas tree, I challenge you to remember that. You know, the last few hundred years leading up to the birth of Jesus were full of turmoil and world-changing events. Starting in 330 BCE, Alexander the Great began his rule and his blitz war on the ancient world, taking just a few short years to conquer much of Asia and Northeast Africa for Greece. From Asia Minor to the Mediterranean, from Syria and Palestine to Egypt, and finally Babylon, Alexander changed the world. And as a result, much of the ancient world began to be more and more conformed with one another. Now, Greek as a language began to be used more and more in the upper circles of nearly everywhere. Uh, Greek culture and philosophies began to integrate with local beliefs. Gymnasiums, Greek entertainment centers started appearing in cities around the conquered kingdom. People began to dress and act similarly. Not only were Alexander's wars militarily effective, but they were culturally effective as well. Somehow, he managed to imprint Greekness onto nearly every nation under his dominion. Unfortunately for the Greeks, power sharing is not that easy and there was no clear line of succession for this newly formed massive empire and it wasn't long before infighting and not long uh, before infighting and the rise of the Romans began to splinter the mighty kingdom into many smaller, easier to conquer territories. All this meant was that once the Romans did begin to flex their muscle against Carthage and not long after the rest of the ancient world, they were able to uh, retain a surprising amount of unity in the empire because everything uh, from language to dress to customs was the same. This made trade, communication, and travel within the provinces incredibly easy. Now, as we all know, the Romans did flex their muscles and eventually after the famed Julius Caesar died, a young 19-year-old Octavian rose to power in Rome and coexisted in a three-way power sharing agreement. Now, after defeating a conspiracy which left one of the three out of the picture, Octavian and Antony, the remaining two, decided to split the kingdom, with Octavian taking Italy in the west and Antony taking Egypt, Syria in the east. Now, Antony turned out fell in love with Cleopatra VII of Egypt and quite possibly at her suggestion, soon began to dream of being king not only of the east, but also of the entire United Empire. Now, as political secrets tend to do, this one leaked and somehow found its way to the ears of Octavian, who uh, did not take the news very passively. Uh, he declared war on Antony in uh, 32 BCE, and he forced Antony and Cleopatra to escape to Egypt. Now, by leaving their center of influence, Antony and Cleopatra left many of their allies and subordinates uh, vulnerable to the power of Octavian. And one by one, each one of them submitted to Octavian, who in the year 30, BCE, finally brought the full force of his might to Egypt. This was all too much for Antony and Cleopatra, who at the sight of Octavian's mighty armies committed suicide, and thus Egypt, the last of Alexander the Great's great Hellenistic monarchies, only 30 years before the birth of Jesus, became a Roman province. And so it was Octavian, not Antony, who managed to finally unite the Roman Empire under himself. He took on the title Augustus, which meant majestic, and he became known as the Princeps, which meant the first or the chief citizen, which he probably only called himself because the Romans hated the idea of a king, even though that's essentially what he'd become. Now, the Roman empires continued on with this facade for like 300 years before they finally began to admit they had nothing to do with the Republic, and they were, for all intents and purposes, kings. Now, Augustus reigned well. He took a moderate line, which did the empire a lot of good. His reign ushered in the Pax Romana, a 200-year span of relative peace within the empire. Now, this peace let Augustus focus his attention instead on reforming the taxation system, um, building a massive network of roads, complete with an official courier system, as well as many other accomplishments. Now, it was this emperor, Augustus, who called a census, requiring each person to go to the town of their birth to be registered. It was because of Augustus that Joseph, a Jewish carpenter, and his young wife Mary, who was with child, began their journey to Bethlehem. See, until that point, without military might, religions and movements couldn't really grow that far out of their home location, their place of origin. But now, at just the right time, 
Jesus was born into a world that was finally able to spread a movement around the globe. God had done the planning. Alexander the Great had done the conquering and conforming. And Augustus had built the roads and provided the peace that would help to take the gospel to the far reaches of the known world. All before Emperor Constantine ever painted one single cross on his shields of battle. Now, at just the right time is a theme that just seems to keep popping up again and again in stories where God is concerned. You know, at just the right time, Esther, a Jew, was made the queen of Persia so that she could save her people from being completely wiped out in a genocide. At just the right time, Joseph was made prime minister of Egypt so that his family, the root of Israel, uh, as well as the entire area, could be saved from a seven-year famine. At just the right time, David and Gideon, both of them the youngest and thus least likely of their families to succeed in life, were thrust into battles that were impossible to win, save for God. And at just the right time, God stepped in and performed wonderful miracles of deliverance. At just the right time, as Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar of faith, he was stopped by God and a substitute was given. And at just the right time, while we were still helpless, Christ died for sinful men. You see, in human experience, it's a rare thing for one man to give his life for another, even if the latter be a good man, though there have been a few who have the courage to do it. Yet the proof of God's amazing love is this, that it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. At just the right time, God will speak into your life also. Maybe it seems like high time or past time, or maybe you feel like you're out of time, but rest assured, at the right time, God will move for you. Today, we've heard from Germany about missionaries stepping in and stopping the child sacrifices by pointing the people to the God with the real power. And we've heard about Alexander and Augustus preparing the entire Roman Empire to receive the news of Jesus' birth. Each time, in each place, God was preparing a miracle far ahead of time. Until the moment the miracle came, however, none of the people could have known what was coming, but far ahead of time, the miracle was being prepared. And as we journey through this beautiful season of Advent, and we remember the miracle of Jesus' birth, maybe you are waiting on your own miracle and, and wondering when God's going to act, if he's even there at all. Take a moment to remember the meaning of the Christmas tree, pointing upwards to heaven, staying green, to remind us of Jesus' unchanging love. Maybe your miracle has already happened and it's just waiting for the right time to reveal itself. Maybe there's already a plan in motion, getting ready to culminate at the moment when you need it the most. If this is you today, in desperate need of a miracle, I encourage you to rest patiently in God, assured that your miracle is coming, like sweet baby Jesus, at just the right time. Thank you.